Well, Greg Barton is a counter-terrorism expert at Deakin University. He was also once an advisor to the former Indonesian President Wahid, sometimes known as the Laughing Sufi. Uh, Professor Barton has also studied the religious underpinnings of the Gulenist movement. He joins us now in Melbourne. Thanks for being there. Thanks, Tony. Good to be with you. Um, Erdogan's purge, as we've heard, is incredibly extensive. 60,000 soldiers, police, uh, judges, teachers, civil servants, sacked, suspended or detained. Is he trying to tear out the Gulenist movement from the society by its roots? That's what he says, Tony, but actually what he's doing goes way beyond anything that makes sense on, on those grounds. He's using that as a pretext to cover what he does, uh, but he, I think he surely knows that uh, his problem is not with the Gulen movement. It's, it's anyone who dares speak up in dissent, whether they're Kamalist or uh, they do have links to the Gulen movement. So this is really a, a smokescreen for a much bigger operation. He's made no secret of his desire for executive uh, presidential power. He didn't have that yesterday. He has it today with emergency rule. And when that expires, if it does in three months' time, it'll, it'll probably be permanent as a result of constitutional change. Yeah, I mean, we know, however, the Gulenist movement is rooted in the schools. Uh, it's global, as we've seen from the schools set up in Australia. Um, Erdogan has now turned the education system on its head. He's closed down 600 schools, tens of thousands of teachers, education ministry, bureaucrats, university deans, all sacked. Um, is it possible that he's just getting rid of every element of the Gulenist movement in the education system, along with everything else? Well, he certainly seems to be trying to do that. In fact, he's been working on that for three years now. The relations with the Gulen movement went sour three years ago, first with the Ghazi Park protest, a very harsh reaction, and then December 2013 with uh, really serious corruption allegations aired through uh, Gulen-linked uh, media outlets. It's kind of remarkable he's got anyone left to purge, but he's certainly uh, made them his public enemy, but there must be many, many more who have no links. I mean, one-third of the general staff of, of the senior military officers are uh, now arrested or, or detained, and, and most of them, you know, given their seniority, would have had no connection with any religious movement because the Turkish military never allowed religious connections. So, um, you know, common sense suggests there's something much more than this going on. Is there any doubt, though, how uh, pervasive the Gulenist movement was, for example, in the police force? I mean, uh, you've had uh, routinely uh, police being recruited, according to anecdotal evidence and stories over a long period of time, recruited promotion in the police force was part of being a member of this movement, according to many. I mean, th there's no doubt, is there, that the movement was infiltrating effectively some parts of the society? Well, Tony, it was a very powerful, still is a very powerful uh, civil society movement in Turkey and around, around the world, one of the, the, the world's most significant uh, uh, moderate Islamic movements, and, and it had enormous cultural sway in Turkey. Um, it's always hard with Turkey to figure out in you know, a fact from fiction when it comes to conspiracy theory, but they were the most powerful uh, movement outside of government control. But in a cultural civil society sphere, uh, whether that amounts to infiltration or whether it just is a natural consequence of, of having an effective education program, you know, is, is a matter of debate. Uh, but they never were a political movement, never aspired to political power. So um, they're being painted as being something beyond what they ever were. Uh, do they pose a, a philosophical and religious threat uh, to... Erdogan's version of Islam? Is that part of the problem here? And, and are they, in fact, Sufi in their nature? Look, they certainly are Sufi. And, and the, the irony is that um, for a decade, as Erdogan was a successful democratic prime minister and the economy grew and, and democracy was consolidated, uh, there was a, a confluence between uh, the same demographic base that voted for AKP, Erdogan's party, and, and the democratic base that basically supported the Gulen movement. Uh, you know, small town conservative, socially conservative, um, but, but Sufistic moderate uh, Turkish Muslims. Um, that split that emerged in 2013 was entirely for personal reasons and you get the sense that Erdogan is so afraid not just of corruption allegations but of the sense that his uh, his religious legitimacy is being challenged by uh, the most revered religious leader in Turkey uh, that he, he finds it necessary to demonize that religious leader so that he he can uh, maintain his claim to be acting not just for the, the people of Turkey but for uh, true religion. He's very much a religious figure, uh, uh, Erdogan, and uh, he, he doesn't want any challenge to his religious authority, although it's, it's, it's put in political terms. So in what way are Sufis actually different uh, in their philosophy, if you like, their religious philosophy, to the kind of Islam uh, which Erdogan would espouse and to Islamism or Islamists generally? 
Well, Islamism is very much a, a here and now focus on political power. I mean, commonly the formulation is uh, application of Sharia, if not an Islamic state, so top-down enforcement of religious moral morality and observance. Uh, Erdogan is representing people and has the popular support of people who are basically sufficiently inclined, but his own inclinations has borrowed a lot from the surrounding Islamism of countries like, uh, like uh, Egypt, uh, where in many respects he's always had a sympathy for the Muslim Brotherhood. That doesn't have a presence in Turkey, but his inclinations always ran that way ever since he was mayor of uh, Istanbul in the, in the 1990s and then became this uh, transformational prime minister of a new party. So um, there's an odd tension there. I mean, in theory, the people supporting him actually uh, have the same religious outlook as, as, as people in the Gulen network, uh, but this is about personal authority. Um, it is interesting to note, though, uh, when it comes to the Gulenist movement, the Catholic Church, even some leading Zionists uh, in the United States have described the principles and teachings of Gulen as the antidote uh, to fundamentalism. Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, Indonesia earlier, Tony. I mean, um, uh, Gustur Adhanom Wahid um, was very different in his personal style than Fethullah Gulen, but I've met Gulen a couple of times, and he strikes me as a similar sort of, uh, you know, moderate, modern, sufistic Muslim. He's more socially conservative than, uh, than Adhanom Wahid uh, was. But in many ways, very similar ideas, and I've looked at the ideas of both men very closely. So, yeah, I think that idea that, uh, you know, people often say Islam needs reformation, that's too simplistic, but you, all religions need a way of coming to terms with the modern world and with plural society. And in, in Indonesia and in, in Turkey, uh, we've seen these leaders offer a way forward, and it's, you know, basically been a good news story. So it's, it's a pity it's mired in political controversy at the moment. Well, Greg, we're uh, out of time. We'll have to talk about this more another time. We thank you very much for coming in to join us tonight. Thanks, Tony.